Hey, welcome to church, everybody. It was so good to start off with worship today. Thank you so much, worship band. And it is an amazing event today. And we would love to welcome you today, especially if it is your first time. My name is Bradley. And I am Precious. We are gathering as a church all around the world in venues, homes, and online. If it is your first time today or you'd like to connect with us, we would like to hear from you. Yeah, feel free to reach out, email us, message us in the chat, or reach out to your host team in your location to find out what is happening across our church movement. In 2020, we launched our partner organization, One by One. This is a fundraising platform to support local charities and relief funds all around the world to impact individuals one by one. Yes, and this year we launched our LFD campaign, which is all about doing something out of your comfort zone and doing something adventurous to raise money. Here's a video for you to watch. We are born with a desire to adventure beyond what we know. Thrill-seeking and exploration is in our blood. We're people who learned how to walk, talk, run, and climb by stepping outside of our comfort zone. We're people who invented the marathon, the ultramarathon, rock climbing, skydiving, and whitewater rafting. From deep sea diving to race car driving, we are built for adventure. Yet, as we grow, we find ourselves bound by the constraints of busy lives, monotonous routines, and distracting technology. What if 2022 was about breaking free from constraint whilst achieving something meaningful for people all over the world? This year, here at World by One, we are launching the LFDE fundraiser. What is it to LFDE? It is simply to live full, die empty. It is to release our potential whilst on this earth. It means adventure, impact, and a whole lot of fun. Perhaps this is the year to face the challenge you've always wanted to overcome. Encourage your community to give generously and see lives impacted one by one. So the question is, what challenge could you do to get involved in this fundraiser? If you'd like more information on what One by One are doing, then visit the website onebyone.org. If you have been part of our church for a while, you will know that we teach in series. And next week, we are starting this amazing new series that you would love to invite everyone to. Yes, the series is called You've Heard It Said, and it's about the parables Jesus told. Yes, and this will be an amazing one. So invite your friends and family to this one. So right now we are going to go into a time of worship. So feel free to stand where you are as we worship God together. We're going to continue to worship. We're going to continue to declare our God is good. That he shines a light in the darkness and the darkness will not overcome this morning. Our God is a God of promises and we stand true to that.
my words fall short I've got nothing new How could I express all my gratitude I could sing these songs as I often do but every song is and you never do So I throw up my hands Praise you again and again Cause all that I have is a hallelujah Hallelujah And I know it's not much Nothing else fit for a king Except for heart singing Hallelujah Hallelujah I've got one response I got just one with my arms stretched wide, I'll worship you. So I throw up my hands, praise you again and again. All that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. Let's declare them, our prayer, our praise. Join us, come on. Come on, my soul. Don't you get shy on me, lift up your soul. Come on. You've got a lie inside of those eyes. Get up and praise the Lord. Come on, my soul, don't you get shy on me, lift up your song. You've got a lion inside of those songs. Get up and Come on, my soul, don't you get shy on me. your home, in your venue right now, here in this place. Come on. So I want to welcome everyone, wherever you are from around the world. We're so glad you're joining us on part four of The Code. And The Code, maybe this is your first part, you're still going to get something great from this, but The Code 
is, the, is all about honor and what God says about honor. In our church, we have a DNA, which is like a code, and part of that is one of those is called We Will Elevate. And it is all about God speaking into the way that we elevate others, ele elevate those perhaps that we're under, those that we're over, those that work alongside us. It's sort of three ways. It's every way. Yeah. Honor isn't just about, you know, many of us, if we've grown up in Christian homes, many of us have heard sort of, you will honor your parents. And that's basically, what do you know about honor? We've got to honor our parents. It's far more than that. And we're sort of... We've been spending the last three week, weeks expanding it, and it's just been incredible. We want to grow that honor in our church. It's so important. One of the big things I started week one on was it, honor is not the same as respect. Respect is something that is earned. You know, we say, I respect, often you have to know the person. It's like, yeah, I respect them because of what they've done. So there's something about their achievement. And whether you approve or not, it's like, you know, yeah, I, I think I respect that person. But honor is freely given, and it's all around position. So uh, for, for me, you know, if I'm going to get stopped on the way home because I'm going a bit faster than I should and that Mr. Policeman is going to stop me, I'm going to have a level of honor. I'm not going to be angry and, and sort of be there thinking, who's he think he is? Because there's honor. I don't know the guy, but I've got honor for what he represents. So this is about position. It's not about the person. And this is what honor is. That's why God says about parents, you've got to honor the position. Yeah. It doesn't mean to say that you agree with all those things. In fact, the Bible says, I don't know if you uh, know this, but it actually says sometimes there's a time to withhold honor. Wow. And you withhold honor, and it says very clearly that you withhold it from fools. Right. It says don't honor fools. And it gives a big description of what that means. And it, it really means those that are ungodly, those that don't believe in what God says, don't honor, right? And now we're not talking about the position, we're talking about the person. And if you, if you sort of somehow attach value and say, well, it doesn't matter how you live, we're just a church that just, we're just going to like almost say yes to everything. Can you see? It says it's like someone who has a slingshot and ties the stone in the sling is going to basically damage your head. And it says that's what it's like if you give honor to fools, it's like, it's like tying the stone and you're gonna, it's not going to leave. It's going to actually injure you. And so there is something very powerful about that. Because sometimes we see in the world that we're in where there is this uh, liberality and almost anything goes. It's like, well, we've just got to honor every, everyone. No, the Bible says, no, you've got to be wise because there are those things where you, where you need to say, do you know what? I want to love the person, accept the person, but in honoring and valuing principles that are not of God is foolish. You got that? So that's just the foundation there. I wanted to add that in because I know you've been talking about this in some of your groups, and I just want to bring some clarity about what that means. There is a time to do that, and Scripture talks about it. But right now, I want to just uh, talk to you, just give you a little illustration, okay? And it's from a comedian. And uh, he, he is great. I'm just going to do a little condensed version, but I want, to, I want to just show you something. And it's all about wasps. And uh, apparently there's three, all of us react to wasps, so these little things that are going to, they may sting you, you know, and you're sat outside at the minute we're summertime in the UK, and outside, even this past week, we just seem to have a lot more wasps, and they know when you've got like a sweet drink of orange juice, they just, it's like everyone, it's like all the wasps in the neighborhood say, there's orange juice, and they all like, they all, they all arrive. And uh, there's, there's sort of three different ways that we react as human beings to wasps. The first one is the wafter. You watch this. Some of you are wafters. And, and what happens is you sat down, you're like with friends or you're having a chat and there's a drink and the wafter is like, you know, uh, you know, you, now you, you try and do this very like in a cool way. You don't want to act like you're panicking. You want to do it in a cool way. Sometimes it's like... <laughs> You know, and sometimes it gets a bit carried away, you're wafting, and, and then sometimes when it's on someone else, you're wafting them as well, you know? It's like, and they're wafting, like, they're trying to keep cool and waft it, but don't overreact. <laughs> then you've got the super cool people who are the don't panickers. Don't panic. Heather's like this. Heather's like this. She's cool. It's like, keep calm. Hev, there's a wasp on your hand. Keep calm. <laughs> Hev, I'm a wafter. I'm a wafter. She said, it's fine. It's fine. It's on your face. It's on your face. <laughs> it's fine. 
She just carries on. Then thirdly, you got the panickers. Suddenly the wasp lands and he's like, ah! and then and they get up from their chair and they run off. And when they run off, they go, follow it, man. It's not following you. The waft is trying to waft it. Now, do you know who gets stung? It's the no panickers. It is, because they're there going, it's fine, it's fine, keep calm, it'll go away, it won't sting me. <laughs> it's so true. And you're thinking, how am I going to bring this into the word? There's three ways we're going to respond to this word. Some of us are going to be wafting it, maybe taking, taking some action. Responding in some way. Some of us are going to have a bad reaction. We're going to want to run out. There is a weight with the word I'm bringing. And with some of the understanding, and maybe if we've been around church for a while, we'll have a theology that will cause us to react and panic. And some of us are going to want to remove ourselves from this situation. Okay? Some of us are going to just try and keep calm and ignore what's going on because it won't be long. Give us half an hour or so, we'll be out of here. <laughs> and I want to encourage you. God wants to do a work in your heart. And for many of us, we react differently to when God brings conviction, the Holy Spirit speaks into our lives. Some of us, we do panic and we sort of, we're almost like, ah, I've got to get out of here. Others, we, we just try and get through because we've got no intention of changing. But God wants us to take some action. He wants us to respond. God's going to see us through. And God has a word that's going to bring life to us. So are you ready to come with me? Wherever you are, come on, people, you wafters. Let's go for it. Genesis 1, 27 to 28. Here we go. So God created mankind in his own image. And in the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. What I want to talk to you about is three-legged honor. Three-legged honor. Some of us as kids used to do the race, the three-legged race where they tie your legs together, right and left leg, and then it was on the marks, get set, go. And you had to learn. And if you found the rhythm, if you rushed ahead and were out, you'd just be on the floor, tangled. But when you found the rhythm, and what I want to speak into is how God created them, that's male and female, so I'm applying to every person right now here, God's word. He created them to come and rule over the earth. And this three-legged honor is all to do with men and women. How do we respond one to another? How we respond as men and women together is all going to be how we're going to get through life. You're either going to struggle and you're going to tumble and you're going to get entangled <laughs> if there is something that is withheld around honor towards maybe a sister, maybe a mother, a woman, a girlfriend. I'm telling you, if we don't understand what honor means... The way that we view each other, the way that God created us together, what did he do? He brought this balance where he said he created them, male and female, clear as that, in his image. So what? So not that man could rule, but they could rule. And yet we've seen through history how this idea that the men rule and the women are wives. And obviously we know that Jesus came to restore that. I believe the body of Christ has been crippled because of the dishonor that is shown towards women. And one of the things within our code, within our DNA, that we will elevate is that we believe in seeing women released in our church. Our pastors, as we pastor and lead, and us guys went away. But do you know what? Our, our wives came and joined us and were part of that on that last day. Because we don't see this as a man thing. We see this as a them thing. We're doing this together. And some people really struggle with that. 
Guys, it says in the last days, Joel talks about it. He says, your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your sons and daughters will dream dreams. The Messiah, Jesus, when he came as this little infant, was proclaimed through Anna, the prophetess. She starts preaching God. She said, this is the one. The first evangelist was Mary Magdalene that runs and takes the news. Jesus sends a group of women to the apostles to proclaim the resurrection. Now, Jesus, this isn't accidental because there was no one else around. He's making a huge statement here. And even in Psalms, right, you'll see places through Scripture where women are called to proclaim the Word of God, to actually preach God's Word. And again, I'm not, I don't want to get involved because this is a whole other subject about the place of women in church and should they be heard and all these things. No, I want to come and speak about honor and the way that we honor one another. So if you've got some of that understanding, I pray God's going to bring clarity and, and he's going to bring freedom in that. But right now, listen to where we're going. God used so many people, so many women. Philip had four daughters, right, who all came and preached. Fancy having four daughters. Like, what do your daughters do? Are oh, the preachers? Yeah. This is back. This is back then, in the New Testament. Here they are. They spoke the word of the Lord. Now, how can we fulfil the commission when half of the body of Christ is dishonoured? And right now, I think God is restoring something. There is an agenda, and what God is doing is He is bringing a dismantling of some of the body. So that he can restore honor to empower and release a rightful place of honor that is them rather than us and them. And so God is moving powerfully. And I want to sort of finish up by speaking into this because Jesus spoke so much in it. And I'll tell you what, if Jesus wasn't for women, he would have said it, right? He did the complete opposite. And even then, when the gospel breaks out in Acts, you see it's the accidental evangelists were the women that established the New Testament church. They used their homes and their resources. Because there's this big sway of what was. See, he's turning what was down up. (laughs) He's, He's changing things. He says, I've come to change everything. It's amazing because even with, we have a ministry in our church called She, which is our, all our, our women's ministry. And some years ago, I remember speaking to Heather about, hey, perhaps you should take this on. Perhaps the women want you to lead them. And Heather didn't want, she didn't want to do it. She didn't want to do it. It It's like, keep cool. I don't want to be, I don't want to be stepping up to that. I don't know if that's me. I don't know if I, and it was all around, I don't know if I've got what it takes. And we went through a whole process of me, so, and sometimes it was a little difficult because I was challenging and I was pushing. I said, there's something in you. Hey, don't, don't you tell me that you've raised five boys, five boys that love Jesus. You have built church with me for like about 30 years, and you've got nothing to say. And I just thought there was something about that. And so... <laughs> there's something about responding. And again, at that point, H could have either just ignored that. It'll go away. Keep calm, he'll go away. <laughs> Got <a little> wasp. <laughs> Keep calm. I won't give up. And today, when I just see even what happened with Dauntless that you've released and what's coming you know, around the world, I, I just sort of see that. And I take a responsibility as a, as a man in God's house to cheer on the women of our house. So this is the point I'm making. It's it's not really all about hate. It's really about what happened if I just would sit back, the easiest thing and most comfortable thing, because we had uncomfortable conversations, would be just to leave as it is. Maybe maybe it's not her thing. She didn't really want to do it. Maybe there's things that you don't want to do, but you're waiting for someone to champion you and say, do you know what, you could do this. Maybe that person is sat right next to you now. (laughs) Maybe it's your husband And this is a challenge. I'm going to be speaking to our husbands right around the world today. And before we go any further, guys, thank you for the come on. Because sort of, I did this some some time ago and I had a complaint from one of the men saying, you give us such a hard time. Yes, I do. Because you're meant to be leading. You're meant to be leading your families. 
And that's, that's the whole idea. We're not, we're not of this world. We're, we're part of this kingdom. And the kingdom, there is a mandate. And if you now are feeling all, all like, oh, uncomfortable and prickly and you want to leave, God wants to speak to you. Because there is a reward when we honor. You can live with your wife and you can somehow step down from the honor she deserves. I believe that God wants to have a church and a bride where there is this value of honor where they rule together. It's, it's so important to fulfill that calling when men nurture the gift of God within women, there is a reward for the church. That's why there is a bankruptcy within church because men have not nurtured the gift that is within the women of God in his church, in the daughters, in those that are stepping forward. The greatest authority you'll ever find is when a man and woman, a husband and wife, that join together, two as one, pray together. It says they rule in authority. It comes from Genesis. This is when they step up. And when you pray for your children, when you step into that place, when you pray miracles, guys, don't neglect it. Some of us, it's been a long time since we prayed. And God is calling us back to prayer. See, this is honor. This is honor. So the code. When I think about the code, anyone who's been married will understand the code. Because men and women speak a different language. And I learned pretty quick that when H says something, she doesn't always mean that. She's looking for me to interpret the code. Yeah. <laughs> and, and just recently, she, a few times, we, we're getting ready to go out and uh, getting dressed up, put my shirt on, and then H said, you look really good. I'm like, oh, thanks. <laughs> thanks. And then she said, what about me? <laughs> I caught on to this, guys. I caught on. When she says you look good, she's going. So now, now I'm like, so do you. You look great. <laughs> guys, you've got to learn quick. You've got to learn quick. When we, when we did have, and I keep coming back to steak because I love steak, but when we had those two steaks, it happens all the time in our house. And, and there's these two steaks. And one is size, it's like, do you know what I mean? It looks better than the other one. It's like, so good. And they're meant to be similar, but they're not. This one's fatter. Do you know what I mean? It's like, it is definitely the best steak. I know H has clocked it, and so have I. And we're there like... But what she does is she gets in there first, and she always says, which one do you want then? Now, guys, this is the moment you've got to use wisdom. I'm thinking, right, well, I could choose the big fat one. But she's going to remind me all the way through the meal. Yours looks really good. Mine's a bit chewy. So before, I would just go for the small one. Do you know what I mean? And then she oh, you know, and we had this little thing going on. But now I've got some wisdom of Solomon. Cut it in half. We're going to split them both in half, half each. Guys, this is how you live in unity. This is like advice for marriage. So there is a code. 1 Peter 3 verse 7. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. Hold on, right, you wafters and you like panickers. <laughs> since, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so, so your prayers may not be hindered, right? This, you've got to listen up to this, right? Listen up. First of all, let, let's just tackle this whole idea of she's the weaker vessel. Man, honor her. She's the weaker vessel. Now, I mean, I don't know about all women. So, some of you women are stronger than your husbands, but generally... <laughs> Generally, you know, uh, I don't know, Heather can lift so much, I can lift a bit more. Can you help me with this? There's a, a, a natural physical strength. But it's also talking about back then, women did not have the advantages. They really didn't have the rights, the advantages. And because of that, we're saying, you've got to make sure you honor these, honor the widows, honor those people that don't have your advantage. I also thirdly think that it refers to I know, like Heather, just the way that she's made as a woman, it's recognizing and honoring and celebrating our differences. Yeah. And, and she is more sensitive than me. 
I don't know if you're surprised by that, but she's more sensitive than me. <laughs> and she will pick up things. Sometimes I'll say something, and she said, Whew, don't think you said that the right way. It's like, you're right. <laughs> she's my, like, wisdom and sensitivity meter. And some people, you know, you could even see that it's, it can be a vulnerability. Think about it. Do you know, our hearts are one of the major things we're told to protect. And with the strength of sensitivity, of discerning in a room, discerning when relationships are, frac- you know, they're, they're broken, those things, sometimes men just go in and say, what's wrong? I didn't notice. But there is something about the wisdom, but also the weakness. And we all have it. And so he's speaking into this, but he said, you know what, you need to make sure you honor. So Peter is saying, make sure you honor the women. Since they are heirs with you of the grace of life. I love this. Heirs of grace with you. So that your prayers may not be hindered. So I've got a great heads up, guys. Some, some of you, you might have believed for years. You might have faith that you have sort of, you know your scripture. You, I don't know, you do the, the best walk you can make. But if you do not honor and bring the honor your wife deserves... It clearly says here, your prayers will just fall off the edge. They won't arrive where they're going to arrive. And this should, like, challenge every one of us. I've known this in past years when I've had to come and perhaps minister or preach. I cannot stand on this stage if I've shown dishonor to my wife. I don't need to sort my heart out, sort those things, because, hey, if my prayers are affected, how can I come and bring God's word? But I want to speak because some of you are praying some prayers right now, but the key, and you're wondering why they have no effect, why they're falling short. And God is saying, honor is connected to answer prayer. If I want to go even broader, this isn't just about marriage, this is about honor in general. I believe if we are not honoring, we're dishonoring, our prayers are hindered. You imagine it when two become one flesh, God says. And when I dishonor my wife, uh, and I just heard a, a couple recently just bickering, and they weren't believers, but the one had to go at the other one, and then, and then the other one sort of had a hit back, you know, and you're just there feeling quite awkward. And you're thinking, when you're called to honor one another, you know, how are we speaking? How are we elevating? How are we, like, championing those that we are married to? Because when we're called to be one flesh and I dishonor my wife, I dishonor myself. That's why prayers aren't answered. When the members of the body, because he also goes in to say, do you know what? When I talk about marriage in Ephesians, you know, I'm talking about, you know, husbands need to do this, whatever, whatever. I'm talking about the church, this mystery of the church and the body and the bride. I'm talking about the bride. And uh, when, when people who are believers or call themselves Christians, insult the bride, the church, you're basically dishonoring, and with that dishonor, your prayers are hindered. Because how can you, you're insulting yourself. There's not a reward in it. In fact, you lose something. Ephesians 5, verse 22 to 23. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. That's pretty, it's like, hey, I, I can submit to the Lord, but I don't know about him. He's not the Lord. <laughs> I mean, that is a huge challenge. Submit yourself to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. But you've got to realize that we are equal. Heather and I, they're, they're, we're equal, but we have different roles. I'm not more valuable than Heather before God. No, we're equal. There's an equality. There's them. But we have different roles. With roles come responsibilities. And scripture talks about this. And when I get in the wrong role, I end up sort of not fulfilling that responsibility. That's when you get dysfunction in family. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the saviour. And I know all around the world that some people, again, have struggled with this because there's been abuse of that towards women. I'm the head of the home. And if any man needs to tell his wife he's the head of the home, he's lost it. There there is something about, you know, this idea of being head. You want to know what being head, it really means. When people say, I'm the head of the house. You want to know what scripture refers to? It's being responsible before God for the spiritual and emotional well-being of your wife and family. So you want to think, I'm the head? 
That's what you need to serve him. It's actually all about serving, responsible before God for the spiritual and emotional well-being of your wife and family. So if your wife and family are struggling, guess who's responsible? I want, I want to bring this, guys. Don't bypass it to the, oh, we haven't really had great teaching in church. Oh, well, just been struggling because no one's, we haven't really got many friends. You need to take responsibility. In fact, right now, we, we do zeal our, our ministry of youth in, in the church. You know, it's so amazing what God is doing. But don't you look to the youth pastors and somehow bypass your responsibility as parents, as a father, and say, well, how come they're not pastoring them? How come for an hour and a half, you're not doing a better job? You've got all week. You, you need to come in and start realizing this is your role, your responsibility. You are a pastor first. So when we talk about the head of the house, you, you're the pastor of your home first. If there's disharmony, you've got to come back to the root. It's you. If there is something that is struggling and difficult, you've got to, you might not have caused it, but it's down to you to come in and lead through it. And for some of us, we walk out of a situation which is a promised land because we're not willing to lead our family, our partner, into a healthy place. It's easier to walk out than actually deal with the ongoing hurt and offense that keeps coming up in their life. And some of us have gone from place to place because it's not long before we get offended. We had expectations. Things weren't met. And so, you know, as a husband, I'm, I'm just going to walk out. No, no, do the honorable thing. It is not honorable. Where you walk out and say, we'll just go somewhere else and we won't deal with this in a healthy, honorable way. People... I tell you what, children have been taken away out of God's best because we're not willing to accept the role and responsibility as fathers. And we will answer for those things. We talk about the talents and we love all those things. But what is the greatest thing you've ever been put in your hands? If you have children, it's your children. Wow, so true. Oh, I did my best there. I had a few challenges. I was a bit busy with work, couldn't handle it. So we walked and took the other option. So when I start talking about the husband as the head of the wife, some of you wives need to go, great! <laughs> but don't, don't you get on his case and start saying, hey, you're responsible for everything in this house. It's a partnership, right? It's the helpmate. It's the cheer on. It's the one that's saying, how do we do this? How do we get to this balance, three-legged race? It's the three-legged race. Let's find the flow. Let's find the way that we can get somewhere with this. Let's pray together. You can't pray together if, if there's not unity. You avoid each other. It's all about proximity. So honor flows three ways in family. It flows to your children. You've got to honor your children. You, we obviously honor our parents if we, you know, as children. And we honor those alongside us, our partners. And that's what I love about this biblical honor. It goes every way. There's an example in the Old Testament of Eli, who was a high priest. Heard about him? Eli, the high priest, who had some sons. And uh, he, he basically was dealing with all the wickedness of the nation, but his own sons were full of wickedness and he ignored it. He's got the top job of holiness. His sons are over here just like full of wickedness. And he's like, oh, I can't confront them. You know, I love them so much. And sometimes we use love as this idea, but it says, no, you hate them if that's what you're doing. If you really love, you bring discipline. And here he is, he ignores and he ignores and then God finally steps in and says, because of this, they're going to die young. Because you have a reward for honor, and you have a reward for dishonor. Guys, I need to speak this to some, and, and I felt in preparing this, this is for, for us as parents, and if you're not married yet, this is incredible wisdom, is the, the men in our house, the the young men, those, I know we've got a load about to get married. This, you need to grab hold of this. But those who are fathers already right now, can you be aware, can you be aware that you are responsible for leading your family? 
and to ignore where those things are like just too hard to deal with. It's too hard to bring him to church because he's 13 and he wants to play on the computer or he wants to go and play sport while we go to church. So it's easier because, you know, we're going to have more of a harmonious home if we let him do what he wants to do. And after all, they said he's so good at the game. Years later, you'll sacrifice the harmony for the loss of legacy. Don't ignore. It's not just about the wickedness. It's actually about leading them. Oh, well, we go to church. Are you leading? Are you leading? I want to ask, are you leading? What does that look like? Maybe, maybe you haven't got a vision to lead your kids. Maybe you need to get together on the back of this message and start saying, what is our vision? To lead our kids, to be godly. It's not accidental. It's intentional. I believe that when God says about men being the head, this head of the home, head of the house, he's saying, will you lead? Lead your family in God's ways, in my ways. Will you lead them into their calling? Will you protect them? Will you raise the next within them? Will you be the role model with your passion, with your giving, with your speech, with what comes out of your mouth, with the demonstration of love and the affirmation of love. Will you be the role model? That's what, this is what being the head is. And yet we've seen it as authority rather than relationship. So God is speaking. He's speaking to us. There's been almost like an abdication of responsibility. And our world has faced this where it has disempowered men. And the trouble is, when I step down from being responsible for my family, heck, there is a big vacuum. There is, there is a cost that is paid. And we're seeing that throughout our world. And so I believe this message. If you're not a believer today, hear the message. But I'm speaking to the church because this is the kingdom. And when it talks about take your, you know, the cover, the shade off your lamp, be the light of the world, be the salt of the world. You can't be the salt without leading. You can't be the salt without the three-legged race. You can. See, when we have this within our marriages, we have it in our families. When you have it in our families, we have incredible churches. When men, and I'm speaking to the men because, guys, you need it. I have seen, I've got this privilege of seeing how people respond and we had dauntless, you know, that went on. And I saw you sold out in two weeks. Two weeks, absolutely sold out. And then when you were sold out, there were still people like trying to get in on it. There's this hunger that I've seen in most women to want to say, I'm, I'm hungry. I want to learn. I want to, I'm ready to change. There, there is something there. When we roll out the horde, which is our men's ministry, right, that happens once a year, the take up is so much slower. Because we're cool. Not wafters, we're cool. Just keep calm. It will come and go until the pastor comes and says, are you coming? And what we do is we step away because men have this thing. We're like islands. We sort of drift and we disappear into our cave to sort our problems out. A lot of you girls talk to each other more. We struggle to talk to each other. So something like the horde, when we come together, I know that some of you have already abdicated coming. You've, you've stepped away and you've said, oh, no, I'm not sure if that's for me, where I'm at. And I want to speak to you guys because I believe God has something powerful for you. And there's something about you recognizing that as men, we withdraw. As men, we, we almost don't want to deal with things. We'd rather go away and process it and almost have the last word. It's called pride. <laughs> Biblical pride is when we reserve ourselves for the last word. And that's what we as men, we get captured in. This is one of the biggest things that erodes honor. Because when we say, I might be right for those guys, but for me, I'm different. Oh, so you're coming ready to serve your brothers then? No, it's not for me. I'm not like that. I can sort these things. And we have seen so many men get in terrible places because they withdrew and told no one what they were going through. And maybe you're in a great place. All the more reason you need to be there to support the brothers. And I want to bring some uh, compassion here right now. 
Because it's not just, oh, I want to withdraw. And I'm so-. Some of you have been through some loss. Some of you have been through some struggles this past year. Maybe you lost your job. Maybe there was discouragement, disappointment. Maybe there were issues within marriage. And we felt disappointed. Maybe we felt even upset with God. He didn't come through on those prayers. Maybe we feel hurt, disappointed with ourselves for the way we let ourselves down. And what we do as men is we step away. See, everything about following Jesus is you've got to get close to him. When hurt and disappointment comes, whether it's your fault, someone else, or it's God himself, what we do is we take a step away. And then once we take a step away, we take another away. And it's not long before we just become quite take it or leave it. So the attitude that I've come across is that we can like, well, you know, I might do. I might sign up. Now in Hereford, uh, in the UK, should I say, in the UK, we have sold all the tickets now. But it, took, it took a bit of us pursuing that. But I want to even say on the back of this message, we're going to make room for you. If you're going to respond to this message, you need to get in touch with your local leader and say, can you find a way of me being there? Because I believe there are some people who said no, and you're actually happy it got booked up. <laughs> that was the plan. And we want to open it up for the next week. And we're going to say, do you know what? There is opportunity for you to come. Because I've got such a passion for the men of our house. And I know we're not the same as women. I know that. I know that we operate differently. But I'm going to come in and I'm going to pull you. And I'm going to encourage you to be in that place. I know that there are so many. You haven't grown because you stepped away. There's calling in some of your lives. There's incredible calling for the vision that's coming next. But you're in danger of getting further and further away. And when it's take it or leave it. Do you know what scripture says that is? It's called lukewarm. Even right now, you're lukewarm in your faith. And that's not because, well, I haven't spent so much time in worship and stuff like that. It's because you decided through some of that failure, through some of the disappointment, it distances you. Less proximity to Jesus. It's easier. And what happens then on the back of that? Dishonor comes in. Because we know that dishonor is treating as ordinary. Make do, take it or leave it. Do you see? And this needs to come and challenge our hearts. This message is a rescue message. Because it's not just for you as maybe that man in the household. It's actually for your children as well. It's something for your children. There's something that God wants to speak into that legacy. We've got to see this happen. At the same time, in Freedom Church right now, I've never seen in all our history so many men volunteering in our Freedom Kids work. So I want, I want to wave that, right, right? I want to wave that. There have been years when we have had like one or two men. <laughs> now we've got a load of men, it's like we need a few more women. But guys, let's turn it around. When our young kids are seeing role models as men. Guys, this is what vision is about. This is what God wants to do. Ephesians 5.25, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and he gave himself up for her. So you might be thinking, hey, you are giving us a hard time. Yeah. (laughs) Have you read your Bible lately? The fruit of my apathy comes from the root of my neglect. This is something you need to realize. Right now, there is like this apathy that crept over your life. More interested in building your own castle, your own career, your own self-interest, because apathy crept in. There was a time when you were on fire for God. You're on fire right now. If you're honest, if you're really, really honest... And you get alongside maybe another leader or brother and ask the question. They'll say, what happened? Where are you? Apathy crept in. And you'll find the root of it is through your neglect of what he gave you. The calling, your role, your responsibility. That's why there are so many apathetic men. Because neglect really is dishonor. Simple as that. John 13, 7 to 8, Jesus replied, you don't realize now what I'm doing, but later you'll understand. And then 
He said, no, said Peter, because he was going to wash his feet. You will never wash my feet. And Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Right here, Jesus, again, demonstrating. I mean, it blows my mind. Jesus saying, I've got something to show you about honor, guys. You want to know how this works? It flows from me as the son of God, washing your feet. Demonstration, the personification of God right there, washing. And Peter is there. I can't handle that. What is it? It's pride. It looks like humility, but it's like pride because he's saying, oh, you're not going to wash my feet. You're too good. And he said, you don't, you're not understanding what, what honor is and how it works. It works every direction. And some of us, we're pushing back what God wants to come into our life. And we're saying, oh, I'm not, I'm not worthy. And he said, no, you've got to understand that God honors you. God honors you right now as a husband, as a wife, as a single person, as a young person, as an older person. There is this incredible honor that you cannot imagine, the value that he placed over your life. It's flowing out. Eli, he lost. There was a loss in his life because he honored his sons more than God. That was the issue. I just love him so much to a fault. Scripture shows you got to put God first. <laughs> you put anything before God, you're not honoring him. And God sees it very seriously. The issue was that he honored his sons more, so he wouldn't deal with it, than he did God. Because of that, he didn't have a reward. He had a loss. Another time, some of the holy men of God, they honored the prophet more than God. And also they were punished. Let's watch how we perhaps honor those that are called to minister to us. Those great speakers that we listen to week on week. Let's watch how we elevate some people or even a denomination of church. I've seen people who got trapped in a denomination where they say, I'm this type of church and I'm that. And it's like there's almost, and you'll live and die for it. And God's saying, I'm not even interested what you call yourself. And you're dying because you're wrapped up in putting it first and relationships have been fractured and God is saying put me first what about our career or our role building our castles God is speaking to you right now and I believe that he wants to convict our hearts not not out of making you feel terrible but out of realizing you have a legacy part of that legacy it's all connected to do with honor how you honor God and place him first and he's saying come on come on after me come Onto that close proximity of me. Why? Because honor is the currency of heaven. As we finish up these four parts, I'll try and just think of a statement and so much you could say. And I just thought, do you know what? This is all to do with the kingdom. You want to know what the currency of the kingdom is? You want to know what the currency of heaven is? It's honor. You'll see it right through. Why? Because Jesus came... God sent him, we know it, John 3, 16, God sent his only son to be rejected and beaten and crucified, what? For you, for your life, because he honored you. This is the greatest act of honor the world has ever seen. It's based in who God is. He honors us while we're still sinners, denying him in rebellion and in our filth. He comes in and he says, precious. He saw you. He sees you right now. Maybe you're sat here now and you're away from God. Maybe you once walked with God. Maybe you haven't chosen to follow him. But he sent his son and he loves you regardless. You might hate him, but he still loves you. He's got a plan to come after you. And even today, he's like moving the curtain saying, I'm here, I'm here. Can't you see me? And our whole gospel, the whole of our life, everything about being a Christ believer is wrapped up in the fact that God gave. Honor's all about giving. It wasn't he respected us. No. He honored us. He honored you. He saw everything, your worst day. And he says, I honor you. I love you. And I'm actually going to pay the price of my son for you. This was the greatest act of honor when he hung on the cross. This was honor in the flesh and blood. He said, here. Yeah. So no wonder he says to his church, honor, honor all, honor, show honor to one another, show honor in the body, show honor. This is where salvation lies. This is the currency of heaven.
And so even right now, I believe there are some decisions to make. I believe some guys have got to sign up and be at the hoard in whatever place you are. God wants to move into your life. Will you bend the knee and submit to your pride and give it a kick in the face? You need to come in and step into what God has. I think there are some things at home that need a change. I think some of your kids need leading. And it might be overwhelming, but there's people in our church that will help you. We'll sit down and say, let's go through some steps. Let's do some things. Let's have a plan together. Maybe with your partner, if you're a single person, parent we want to also be here for you to champion you don't feel disempowered through this God has you there's grace for you in all of this but take action today on the back of this otherwise the code will just come and go or this message will be the game changer of your life where you understood what it really was to honor there is such potential in this word for marriages future marriages for parents for children that are going to go on as we raise the next. In Jesus' name, God bless you guys. Amen. Amen. Wow, what an amazing series we had. Thank you so much, Pastor G, for that. Um, yeah, let's get honoring and let's get uh, those next steps going and applying them in our everyday lives. Yes, and if you are watching from Facebook and would love to reach out, or maybe you have responded to the message, feel free to message us or um, reach out in the comments. Or if you are watching us from wherever else, feel free to email us at hello at freedomchurch.cc. We would love to hear from you. So with that said, see you next week for the next series. Bye. Bye.